Welcome back, folks. Uh, this video lecture is on macromolecules pertaining to the contents of a cell. The agenda is straightforward. Uh, we're going to review, and once we've reviewed uh, previous knowledge, we're going to look at what's inside a typical cell. And then we're going to look at the breakdown of those particular substances, uh, small molecules, large molecules, energy molecules, storage molecules. And then we'll look at some common biochemical reactions that are necessary uh, to migrate the molecules from the various sizes uh, to macromolecules. And then we'll look briefly at how energy is handled inside a typical cell. And then finally, we'll have a little closing uh, argument about uh, the size of atoms and the strength of um, bonds within a cell. So let's get started with a review. So cell biology reviews. So far we have learned that some cells uh, live alone, solitary cells. In fact, most of the cells on this planet are solitary. So your prokaryotes, most of them are solitary, the vast majority. Uh, most of your protists are solitary. A large number of your yeasts, which are fungi, are solitary. And of course, there's a few animal cells that can become solitary, but they like to live in colonies. So plants and animals are multicellular. Some protists are also multicellular. And a very few number of species of bacteria also like to live in strings of cells, and they would then be considered multicellular. So a colony of cells differs from cells which live alone in two ways. If the colony has specialized cells, specialized tissue within that colony, i.e. certain cells are reproductive and other cells are not, they're digestive or sensory cells, then you have a division of labor. And once you have labor, then you have the potential to specialize. And specialized cells, by definition, find it very hard to survive on their own. So a skin cell from your body could not survive alone outside of your body because it's so specialized, it relies on other cells within the colony, within your body, to supply what it needs that's missing within itself. Whereas single cells can supply everything they need from reproduction to feeding to elimination of waste and to respond to challenges. Next, we talk about the size of cells. As we know, evolution has resulted in cells of various sizes uh, existing on the planet. But even inside your body, uh, you have a great disparity in the size of all the cells combined. So your neurons can be extremely thin and long, but you also have immune cells uh, that can be very large, like uh, macrophages. And under certain circumstances, uh, you can get giant cells developing in your body. So this is just a fact of life, something to do with the evolution. The next two bullet points uh, go together, more or less. As we learned in the past, um, the history of the planet is dotted with cells eating other cells. Generally, large cells eat smaller cells. And there's evidence around us that that continues in the present day. The purpose of large cells eating small cells is generally to obtain food, um, but it can also be for defensive purposes. Just like in your body, you have white blood cells that eat bacteria. Regardless, one of the consequences of these past actions has been the coexistence in an in endosymbiotic fashion of ancient cells that could digest food better than the cells that ate them. And those ancient bacterial cells eventually became mitochondria. Uh, a subsequent event to a subsection of these mitochondrial bacterial type containing cells was a second event of endocytosis, uh, which resulted in the formation of chloroplasts. And that particular branch of cells led to the plants that we have today. So the history is quite convoluted, but fascinating regardless. If you look inside cells, let's move over to the first slide for this particular lecture. And it poses a question. 
What's inside a typical cell? Let's put it in this context. If I was to take two cells, maybe a bacterial cell and an animal cell, and I was to remove the contents and put them into a blender and then give them to you as two different test tubes and ask you to identify which was a bacterial cell and which was a animal cell, unless you went to very deep biochemistry, you won't be able to tell the difference. Because essentially, all cells on the planet, barring some specialized cells like uh, fat cells and seed cells, but most cells on the planet, at the fundamental level, are composed of exactly the same substances. And what are those substances? Well, let's have a look at them. Uh, we'll do a cell here, just to help us understand the nature of the material inside the cell. So the first thing to understand is cells are made of matter. Matter. And as far as we are concerned in this class, matter consists of atoms at the most fundamental level. But you don't find many atoms alone, solitary, inside a cell. Most of the material exists as something more complex. You do find ions within cells, positive and negatively charged ions. And an example of that will be sodium and chloride. You also find most of the matter inside the cell in the form of molecules. Some of those molecules are small, many are large, as we'll find out on subsequent slides. Further, some of the matter inside the cell is complexed into compounds, uh, molecules that are consisting of different types of atoms combined together. In other cases, we just have mixtures. In fact, if you take the totality of the cell, there may be substances over here coexisting with substances over here, but the two are not associated with each other. The way to understand a mixture, if you don't already know, uh, would be an example that I was, I was given at high school, where you take sand and salt and you mix them together. It's quite easy to separate the grains of sand away from the grains of salt and still have different compounds. So that substance would be a mixture where it's not chemically interacted. And of course, the one that students always forget, and it's not matter, but it's a complement to matter, it's called energy. So without energy, cells on this planet would not last very long and would in fact die. And we've mentioned that before. So let's focus a bit more on the inside of a cell. One of the most fantastic elements on this planet happens to be carbon. Other than hydrogen, carbon is unique. It has the ability to form four handshakes or bonds, uh, covalent bonds, with neighbors, including other carbon atoms. And not only does it have the propensity to form four handshakes, those handshakes can be pretty strong. So something in the periodic table that sits below carbon is silica or silicon, right? And silicon also can make four handshakes with other material but those handshakes are weaker. The maximum it can make will be far weaker than the maximum that carbon can make. So carbon is ideal in that sense. So it's a fantastic go-between connecting atoms together. The second most important element inside the cell is hydrogen. Not only does hydrogen bond with oxygen to form water, hydrogen can bond with carbon to form hydrocarbons the building blocks of most molecules inside the cell. Hydrogen can also break down and regulate pH. Hydrogen can also alter the properties of existing chemistry inside the cell. In fact, hydrogen can be used to relay energy to different parts of the cell. So hydrogen is also a wonder element. The most common component of a cell is inorganic. Why? Because most cells, most cells, would be about 70% water. Okay, H2O. And because carbon is missing out of this molecule, 
it's not an organic molecule. To be considered organic, the molecule has to have at least carbon bonded to something else, right? So carbon can be bonded to oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and then it will be called an organic molecule. The next thing that we need to be aware, and we'll see this in future chapters, is that if you can add a chemical group onto an existing molecule, you can change its properties. For instance, if you have uh, ethane, ethane is a hydrocarbon, so you have a hydrogen, 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 and another hydrogen here bonded to two carbons, that's ethane. By adding an OH group to ethane, by adding an oxygen in between the hydrogen and the carbon here, you now have converted that to an alcohol, ethanol. And ethanol has completely different properties to ethane. Whereas ethane doesn't like to mix with water, uh, ethanol will readily mix with water. So by substituting these chemical groups onto existing molecules, you can change the nature of the interactions that take place within the cell. Very important. And it's quick to do, and it's simple, and it's better than reinventing the molecule from scratch. So the most common chemical groups within cells will be, just like we mentioned here, OH groups, and there may be also oxygen involved in those groups, right? So when you get oxygen, you get one oxygen, two or three. And then you can also get sulfur. Sulfur atoms can be added to change the identity. In fact, if you look in the section of the notes, you'll find that there's a whole list of these uh, side groups that can be added or removed from molecules to change their behavior. You don't need to memorize them. But just know that that's a good way that the cell can alter its chemical interactions. Over the next two slides, you're going to get a good idea of the nature of these chemical substances inside cells. So they're divided into two classes. We have small molecules, and on the next slide we'll discuss large molecules. And the cell spends a lot of its energy moving material between the two classes of molecules. What do we mean by that? Well, let's start by looking at a general situation. Your cells. So your cells are receiving from your blood a supply of food that comes in. And the food molecules come at a relatively small size. They enter the cell because they can, because they're small. Once inside the cell, they can be constructed into larger molecules that can not just serve a purpose for the cell, but are also prevented from leaving the cell because of their size. So the membrane of the cell, the plasma membrane, has the ability to transport certain size molecules, but not others, either by design or by nature, the laws of physics and chemistry. So let's just look at small molecules on this slide. So if you take a typical cell, and as we said on the previous slide, uh, you were to deconstruct it, uh, it about 70% of that cell would be made of water, right? Uh, so 70% of the substance within the interior of the cell will be water. So water is a very important component of living things. In fact, it's one of the telltale signs of life. And if you're a NASA scientist and you're looking elsewhere, you may be looking for a signature of life via looking for a signature of the presence of liquid water on that planet. Beyond water, the most common ingredients at the small molecule level inside a cell would be ions. Ions. So ions are very important. And those ions, as we said earlier, uh, they can include sodium ions, very important, uh, for instance, in nerve impulses. Uh, chloride ions, uh, they associate and regulate the membrane potential. Then we have calcium ions, and we have potassium ions, 
And in fact, we have hydrogen ions. And there's many, many more ions that I could talk about. But ions are a very simple ingredient that allows a cell to alter or regulate and respond to the environment. The other most common small molecules found inside cells would be carbohydrates, which go by two other names, uh, sugar and saccharides. Uh, fatty acids, uh, these are molecules that do not like to mix with water, and they're also called uh, lipids. Uh, amino acids, which you're familiar with, uh, they are the building blocks of proteins, but amino acids can serve other functions too inside a cell. And the one that students always forget, uh, nucleotides, uh, the building blocks of DNA and RNA. So taken together, uh, all of these exist in various forms, from small molecules to medium-sized molecules to larger molecules. In most cases, each one of these has multiple functions that nature has sequestered them for. Without going into too much detail, some of these can act as hormones regulating the behavior of your body. Others can relay energy from one part of a cell to the other. So nature is quite amazing in the way that it can use chemistry and its different properties to benefit itself. Focusing our attention on large molecules some of these are called macromolecules because they're absolutely huge. But large molecules are good enough for us. There are four classes of large molecules. The sugars, the complex sugars, the lipids, the fats, the proteins made of amino acids, and of course our nucleic acids, the DNA and RNA of a cell. It's nice to know what proportion of a cell consists of these large molecules in comparison to the small molecules. So again, another figure will be appropriate here. So let's draw a typical cell. And as we said earlier, uh, the most common ingredients of a typical cell, about 70%, is going to be water. Okay. So water, either part of the cytosol, or combined with other components in some form. The remaining 30% has to then be divided amongst the large molecules and the small molecules that we spoke about on the previous slide. So that 30% has then to be distributed evenly amongst the remaining structures. About 5% of the 30%, so about a sixth, it's going to be your small molecules, right? Uh, the ions and the other building blocks that we spoke about uh, on the previous slide, this slide here. So these and these. So that's going to represent about 5%. Almost half is going to be protein. So protein has a significant role to play inside a cell, and that makes sense. Uh, the cytoskeleton of cells that have cytoskeletons uh, is very important, and then the proteins are part of the biochemical machinery, enzymes, etc., etc. So proteins play a significant role inside all cells. Uh, of the remaining part, uh, a large portion of that is going to be nucleic acids. So nucleic acids will occupy a large proportion of the remainder. And then the final two slices would be then distributed roughly equally uh, between uh, sugars and lipids. Okay. So let's give some percentages, right? So we said that proteins occupy maybe half of the 30%. So this is the total. So that would be 15%. And then that small molecules will take up 5%. That's 20%, right? So we have 10% left. So out of the 10%, 5% uh, will be nucleic acids and uh, DNA and RNA. And of the remaining 5%, 
maybe uh, 3% will be lipids and 2% will be carbohydrates. And that's typical. And like I said, if a specialized cell has a need to change any of these, like a fat cell, it could uh, have its lipid content increased to over 90% because that's a specialized cell. A potato could increase its storage of sugar starch to over 90%. But those are specialized cells. We're talking about atypical cells. So this gives us a good idea of the ratio of different types of molecules inside a cell. And that's the purpose of this particular lecture. As we mentioned previously, the energy needs of a cell are fundamental. So which of these classes of molecules provides that energy in the form of breaking bonds? Covalent bonds are the main way that this energy is supplied. Well, short-term energy needs are supplied by sugars short-term energy needs. So every cell on the planet has the ability to break down carbohydrates and to extract that energy from that molecule and use it for living. Carbohydrates themselves, this class of nutrients, is broken into three subclasses based on the size of the molecule. The simplest are small molecules, small carbohydrates. We call those monosaccharides. Under normal circumstances, a carbohydrate molecule will form a ring-like structure inside a aqueous environment inside the cell. So we represent them as rings. So single ring structures are called monosaccharides. When two rings come together through covalent bonds, we call them disaccharides. And then when that process continues for hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands or millions of units, we call those polysaccharides. So all they are are building blocks of these Lego bricks that are built up into larger and larger structures. And the opposite can also be performed by the cell. It can dismantle these large molecules down to smaller size and then even smaller sizes. And then even these molecules can be then broken apart to release their energy that's stored inside these covalent bonds. What you need to know are maybe uh, these seven different labels that you see at the bottom that I'm about to complete. So let me get to the uh, text um, icon and we can start typing stuff in here. So as I mentioned uh, in a previous lecture, sugars are not good for you. In fact, one of the consequences of eating too much sugar, the main consequence from the nutritional perspective, is that you get tooth decay. Um, so eating sugar leads to tooth decay unless you clean your teeth constantly. So that reminds me of an acronym. So GFG are the three main types of monosaccharides in our diet and I remember them by understanding good friends gone. So think about that. Good friends are your teeth and if you eat too much sugar your teeth are gone. So the first one stands for glucose. So everybody's familiar with glucose, right? It's the main sugar that we all consume too much of. The next one is a fruit sugar called fructose. And you can see the structure of fructose over here, right? So it's not identical to glucose. The atoms are rearranged in different positions. So it's a cousin of glucose, but still it's a carbohydrate. And the last one is uh, galactose. So galactose is an alternative form uh, of the same atoms rearranged in a slightly different fashion. So those are the three most common types of monosaccharide, right? Um, let's move on to disaccharides. And in this case, uh, my learning aid is Major League Soccer, believe it or not. And uh, in my head, M stands for a disaccharide. And that's going to be maltose. Maltose is the main sugar that you find in grains. Moving on to lactose, mother's milk. Um, lactose is a disaccharide that supplies energy. And then the last one is table sugar. And that's going to be sucrose. So what relationship do these have with the monosaccharides? 
Well, maltose is made up two molecules of glucose stuck together to form a disaccharide. Uh, lactose is formed from one glucose plus one galactose. And then sucrose, table sugar, is formed from glucose plus fructose. So all of them have at least one uh, glucose. Finally, the two examples of a polysaccharide that we like you to remember is the one that you find in animals' bodies and the one that you normally find in plant tissues. So the first one is going to be called glycogen. Glycogen is found in the liver and in your muscle cells. And the last one is called, of course, starch. A little difficulty typing it out, but we got there. Next, we have the main storage molecules used by cells. And it won't surprise you that these are lipids, fats. Uh, as you know, uh, when you eat a lot of calories, uh, you gain weight. And the reason you gain weight is because we are evolutionarily geared towards storing energy because we don't know when the next meal would have come in the past. So lipids is the general term that we should be using. And they include waxes, uh, they include fats, and they include uh, steroids. So you see down here, this is the general ring-like structure that most of our hormones are based upon. And if you look carefully, you will notice that this structure looks like a caterpillar. So in my head, this is a very important structural lipid. And this one here is cholesterol. So cholesterol is the building block of more complicated hormones, uh, mainly your sex hormones, like testosterone and estrogen. So that's just one class of lipid, right? We call those uh, steroids. Then we also have a second class called a fatty acid, right? And a fatty acid is basically a chain of carbons and hydrogens. So these represent carbons and hydrogens with a small head that contains oxygen. So this molecule here has both a water hating feature, water fearing, and a water loving feature, because this side is polar and this side is non-polar. So that's a very good aside. Please remember this following word forever. Amphiphatic, and I'll type it out later. Amphiphatic. It means that one molecule has two faces. It has a water-loving face and a water-hating face, right? So this molecule here, this fatty acid, has a amphiphatic nature. It hates water and it loves water at the same time. So in the presence of water, it will take up a particular direction to the way that it sits in conjunction with water. That's very important. But we'll come back to that in the future. The third type of lipid are your waxes, right? And waxes are used uh, for waterproofing things. So leaves, plants, they have lots of waxes on their leaves and stems to prevent water loss and infection by uh, pathogens like uh, fungi. And then we have our fourth class of lipid, and maybe the most significant for this class. These are your phospholipids, phospholipids. The phospholipids are basically cousins of number two uh, because they're built upon the fatty acid structure. The phospholipids consist of two, normally, fatty acids bonded to a head that contains some phosphorus. And then it may have something else attached to the phosphorus. And you can see, this doesn't look like a caterpillar, it looks more like a bird. So in my head, phospholipids can be related to birds. Um, these fats, fatty acids, normally form uh, fat molecules in the blood, and they look like jellyfish with three tentacles like that. And then if you take one of the legs and you remove it, and then you put a head on top, you end up with a phospholipid. Let's focus on a couple of principles coming out of this particular reading. 
The first thing is that you can take simple molecules and construct them into larger molecules. And at another time, you can take those larger molecules and deconstruct them back into simpler molecules. When we study these chemical reactions in detail, we find that in most cases, the most common mechanism that a cell uses to go from one low-level molecule to a more complex molecule is by the use of these types of chemical reactions known as condensation hydration or condensation hydrolysis, right? So hydration and hydrolysis are equivalent. How does this work? Well, we have an example here. So we have this complex molecule made of three rings. And what we want to do is make it simpler by breaking one of the bonds. The bond that we're interested in breaking is this one here, the one that connects the phosphorus to the oxygen. The best way to do that is to supply one molecule of water into this system here. So the molecule of water will combine with this molecule and give us our broken bond. The water molecule is itself dismantled into two parts. The first part is the hydrogen. The hydrogen from the water is removed and given to that oxygen, this oxygen here. The remaining part of the molecule, the OH, is over here. So you can see water is split and then different parts of that is donated to the destination molecule in order to achieve this type of chemical reaction. Now, what do we call this? We call this hydrolysis. So think about it. Hydro means water and the word lysis means to break. So using water, we can break this molecule down to a simpler form. So that will be an example of a hydration reaction. Hydration reaction. So complex down to simple. If you wanted to go the other way, you wanted to take this simple molecule and make it into a more complicated structure, then you would do the opposite. You would do a condensation reaction. Here, you would have to take these atoms, break that box, uh, sorry, break that bond, <laughs> and then remove the hydrogen, and then combine them together and then you will get water coming out of the system. That's what that minus sign means. Water is produced from the chemical rearrangements going on inside there. So this part here down the bottom will be a condensation reaction. The way I look at this is you have one molecule and you have another molecule and you squeeze them together like two sponges. Then you may get a drop of water coming out the bottom. And that will be a condensation reaction. The opposite is hydrolysis, where you supply a drop of water from above and the two sponges can now be separated. When are these reactions significant? They're more significant than you think. As we learned earlier, the simple structures of the three classes of molecule inside the cell are amino acids. And when the amino acids are com complex together to form the large molecules, you get proteins. So when you put amino acids together to make dipeptides, uh, yes, uh, you have a type of condensation reaction. So condensation reactions build proteins from amino acids. How about sugars? You can take some su simple sugars and you can bond them together to form disaccharides and eventually you can form complex sugars, right? Like uh, glycogen. Then you can also take small lipid molecules and using condensation, you can have more complicated lipid molecules like uh, the phospholipids that we spoke about earlier. Okay. And then finally, um, you can take nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA and RNA, and then put them together to get your nucleic acids. So all of these steps are going to involve condensation reactions. And if you want to go backwards from large molecules to small, then you'll be using hydrolysis to break those molecules down. So these are very important for you to know. And whenever you see a diagram where two simple 
molecules are coming together. See if you can see where the water molecule may be utilized in a condensation reaction. Let's quickly address energy handling within a cell. So energy is a force that cannot be generated or destroyed, and we'll learn that in the next uh, set of lectures. So energy can only be converted from one form to another. Now, if you don't handle the energy properly, it can become useless. It can become non-usable. So energy is the driving force for life. So any energy that the cell obtains has to be handled properly. One way to handle energy inside a cell is to pass it to molecules that build covalent bonds, and those covalent bonds can carry packets of energy. And believe it or not, one of the prime handlers in all living things is ATP. What is ATP? It's a nucleotide. A nucleotide, yes. Uh, it's the molecule that we use for building RNA and subsequently DNA, right? So it's not just an information molecule for carrying information in DNA, it's also an energy carrying molecule. So ATP is a nucleotide. That means it consists of a ring of sugar bonded to a base. And in this case, it's gonna be the A. So the base is gonna be an A. Remember, a DNA can contain four types of bases a, C, G, and T, and in this case, the base equals an A. That's why it's called adenine triphosphate. And then over here, we have three phosphates. One, two, and three, bonded to this one molecule right there. So everything is bonded together, right? So aden adenosine triphosphate, right? And this sugar here is ribose. This bond here has a unnatural property of carrying a lot of energy. It's unusual in the chemical world. So is this bond here, right? So these two bonds connecting the phosphates together, they carry extra energy. And when you break these bonds, that energy is released. But to store the energy, you make these bonds. So you make the bond, your energy is stored, and then you break the bond, the energy is released. So this molecule can be recycled many, many times per second in a cytosol cell. So if you consider that as a rechargeable battery, then this was the world's first rechargeable battery, as far as we know, inside living cells. This bond here has a name. It's called a, it's a covalent bond. So the covalent bond has a name just to differentiate it from other covalent bonds. It's called a phosphoanhydride bond. And that bond is one of the most powerful bonds uh, in the living world, right? Um, the purpose of putting that label down below is that there's many other types of covalent bonds that have names. So we don't just call them a covalent bond. In a particular combination of atoms, then we can apply a particular name. So uh, between two amino acids, that's called a peptide bond. Between two saccharides, that's called a glycosidic bond. So we need to learn at least five of these different types of bonds uh, before we conclude this course. What I'd like you to do is to research the difference between these two cousin bonds, right? One is related to the other, but the context in which they are applied uh, is particular. Let's finish off today then by just making a summary statement. Uh, the patterns that we have seen so far up to this point are that atoms are the fundamental units of matter and life is made of matter and it requires energy to continue. The types of atoms that you find inside living cells do not represent exactly what's found outside the cell. The cell membrane filters the type of chemistry that's present inside the cell. Further, the DNA guides the cell to make the type of chemistry that that cell needs. The elements that are used for constructing the molecules inside a cell normally have 
a relationship to the periodic table. They normally form the first few rows of the periodic table. That means these are small atoms with their electrons quite close to their nucleus, so that when they do form both ionic bonds and covalent bonds, the bonds are strong in many cases. So that gives those structures some permanency inside the cell. You don't want your DNA falling apart as soon as you gain some heat from running. But at the same time, if everything was permanent inside your cell, there would be few options for changing the structure. Thus, life can use non-covalent bonds for temporary interactions within cells. And that is a very, very important key understanding of the relationship between cell biology and chemistry. Thank you so much.